who knows? Um, we are gathered here virtually because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I, again, am so grateful to those at Bowdoin who have established some really rigorous safety protocols. Um, and of course, the technological support to really make this event happen for Kat and I to be in the same space safely, wearing our masks and with one, two, a whole bunch of cameras and lights and fancy technology. Um, so I'm grateful for those at Bowdoin to, who have um, helped us kind of get to this, this point where we can really uh, begin a new tradition of virtual page turnings. Um, before we get started again, I, I also want to call attention to the ongoing unrest with regards to the fight for social justice and efforts to dismantle systemic racism happening across the United States. Um, over the summer, I worked with my um, colleagues, uh, Beth Hoppe, research librarian and digital archivist, Megan Doyle, to draft an anti-racist action plan for the Bowdoin College Library. And the leadership team here have embraced that plan, and the entire staff of the library has now embarked um, on the critical examining of white supremacy in ourselves and in our work practices, and to really do the work to build an anti-racist library. Um, for more information in a bit, I will pop the link to that full text in the chat for you. Um, so look for that a little bit later on in the program. Um, and maybe this seems a bit far adrift from why we gather here today, but in fact, John James Audubon himself was connected to slavery and the long arc of racism in America. And earlier this year, there was the incident with um, science writer Christian Cooper being accosted in Central Park while birding. Um, since we began the monthly page turnings in January 2016, I have been blown away by the power of this book to bring people together um, to consider Audubon, birds, the environment, art, books, and so much more in both a historical and a contemporary context. So to that end, I'm in the midst of confirming speakers for October and December page turnings to specifically address race and the intersections with Audubon's Birds of America. Um, and in November, I'm delighted, um, we are all delighted to welcome members of the Bowdoin class of 2024 who are enrolled in Professor of Art History's uh, Dana Bird's course, Faked, Forged, Stolen, and Repatriated, Crimes Against Art. So that class will be joining us as our guest speakers virtually. Um, so please join us monthly this fall. Uh, we'll convene on the first Friday of the month at 12.30 p.m. as per usual. Um, and let's see, do, 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 do. I promise I will stop speaking shortly because you're all here to see the Audubon page turning, but I've just got one more uh, sort of plug for future programming. Um, I'm really excited to announce a new series called Beyond the Reading Room, Archives in the World. This is a virtual lecture series that features artists, scholars, and Bowdoin alumni who rely on archival research to do their work. Each speaker has a connection to the Bowdoin Libraries, George J. Mitchell Department of Special Collections and Archives, where I come to you from today. Um, and they've either consulted our archival collections or have their own work represented within them. So um, to learn more about the role, um, and this, this is, I'm encouraging you to join us to learn more about the role of archives and scholarship and creative practices. So please check out our news and events page. I'll pop that link in the chat in just a moment um, to register for those programs. Okay, on to today's program. Here, this is, this is the normal part. Kat and I know how to do this part. First, I'm gonna introduce our guest speaker. Then we're gonna flip the bird. This is where I should ask all of you to unmute so I can hear you laughing at that joke that I realize I've been making since January, 2016. Clapping. We're gonna flip the bird. Um, and then I'll turn things over to our guest speaker, Avi Gittler. So I first learned about Avi Gittler and the Audubon Mural, Mural Project um, with thanks to Jane, who is a regular page turning attendee um, she had shared with me a 2017 New York Times article, and um, she did that because she had been in New York and serendipi serendipitously encountered the Audubon murals while there. Um, it took me over a year to finally reach out to Avi, who was so incredibly gracious and excited about this little event that we do here at Bowdoin. Um, one of the silver linings, I guess, of the pandemic is that um, with us gathering virtually, um, we can now welcome Avi here to our reading room and to all of you. Um, but of course, we will work to bring him to Bowdoin in person. So a bit about Avi, and then we will flip the bird. 
Avi Gittler is an art dealer and gallerist in and around New York City. He comes to the work as an evangelic, evangelist, <laughs> evangelist, wow. <laughs> Thanks, Avi. <laughs> um, you can see that I've been spending a lot of time working from home and not speaking in public. So this is going really well. Evangelist is the word I'm looking for. Um, for the artists who find their home in the forum, um, who, who find their home in the forum, he has created Gitler Ant. The organization's name du duly signifies an ongoing collaboration with the artists he represents and the generative, whimsical, and sometimes mischievous interactions he seeks to foster with each project mounted by the gallery. Gitler's business began with a devotion for travel and to the artists he met along a 10-year odyssey around the world, both of which culminated in his first shows, pop-up galleries and installations in Tribeca, Chelsea, and Midtown Manhattan. Since 2011, Gitler has organized close to 70 exhibitions, most of them in his Harlem gallery. He curates community and art simultaneously and makes accessibility a primary focus of the gallery's program. Gitler is also co-creator of the Audubon Mural Project, a vast public art initiative aimed at the consciousness raising around climate change through the lens of the threat that birds face in the throes of the climate crisis. That project began in New York City in the neighborhood that bird artist and ornithologist John James Audubon lived in his last years. And it has since been adopted in cities across the United States. His work has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, on PBS, and in many other media outlets. So welcome, Avi. Um, we're going to flip the bird and then turn things over to you to learn more about your work and the Audubon Mural Project. So, cast now behind the camera. Here is the Audubon. Again, we're looking at the black and yellow warbler. Yeah? We are. Okay, we are. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> yes, indeed, we are. Um, so again, um, for those of you who have never joined us for this, um, this is, uh, Kat and I handled this book with our bare hands, but we have washed them. Um, and so that actually allows us to have a little bit better tech, sense of tactile when we, when we change it, when we touch it. <clears throat> the um, acid-free tissue paper that we're putting is, um, helps so that the, it uh, doesn't imprint, there's no sort of acid from the hand coloring. And here we go. And so we have September's bird of the month, the red-tailed hawk, um, who we see here with the American hair. So, Avi, I'm gonna turn things over to you. And welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's kind of weird. I feel like I'm talking to a book. <laughs> um, and assuming everybody can see me, it feels really appropriate that the uh, American hair is part of the image because of my terrible COVID beard, which <laughs> most of my family is desperate for me to cut off. Um, I, I was really uh, tickled to be asked to be involved in this. Um, partially because I like the bird, the rail-tailed hawk, which is such a common um, a raptor here in the United States and, and has a special connection to New York City, uh, where I'm originally from. Um, anyone who knows birds in New York knows that one of the most famous red-tailed hawks, um, pale male, lived for many years on a building next to Central Park. So, you know, red-tailed hawks, especially pale male, um, you know, are, it's, it's quite a beloved bird in, in New York over the last 25 years. Um, I, I was really honored to be asked to talk about my project. Um, I'm gonna actually share my screen if that's okay. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what I've been working on over the last five years. Um, I'm happy for people to go off mute because it's a little bit strange. I feel like I'm talking to myself. Um, can everyone hear me? Thumbs up? Yes. Okay, amazing, awesome, thanks. Sorry, a little bit strange. 
So, um, as Marieka uh, mentioned, uh, I co-founded the Audubon Mural Project in late 2014 um, with um, the then Vice President of Content of the National Audubon Society, Mark Janot. And, um, you know, <laughs> I'll go back a little bit. Sorry, I'm a little bit of a techno, folks. So I need to figure this out. Okay, I figured it out. So, essentially, in 2014, I opened an art gallery uh, in a neighborhood that I grew up in um, on Broadway and 149th Street. And I wanted to paint a couple of shutters adjacent to my gallery, um, just bring some attention to the gallery. And uh, an artist that I was working with at the time named Boy Kong, who's really cool, uh, he was the only artist I knew that sort of dabbled in in street art um, beside for fine art, which is really uh, what I'm involved in. And he said to me, because he's from Florida, he said, I want to come and paint a flamingo for you. Um, and he did. Um, my gallery would be just to the side. And as soon as he suggested a bird, which I was kind of disappointed about originally, because I thought, oh, let's, I wanted something even more powerful. Um, I sort of made the connection after he suggested a bird uh, to the naturalist and painter, John James Audubon, who's buried five blocks from where my gallery was located. Uh, that's his uh, marker over his uh, crypt, uh, Trinity Cemetery uh, at 155th Street and Broadway. And on the right, you can see uh, his swallow-tailed kite, not the, the red-tailed hawk, but the swallow-tailed kite, which you'll see why I'm showing it later. Sorry. And basically, I'm terrible with Zoom, apologies. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, um, we painted this flamingo and we painted another bird. And that was the point at which I met uh, Mark from the National Audubon Society, and he came to me and he said, this is in late 2014, um, we've been working for years on new climate modeling uh, at, at Audubon, and we've just put out a new report, Survival by Degrees, and we believe that more than half of North American bird species are threatened by climate change in this century, and instead of painting the five or so birds in connection to Audubon that you had been thinking about on your block, we thought it'd be really cool if you would consider painting all 314 birds uh, in our climate report. And I thought it was a really swell idea and we shook hands right away. Uh, the first thing that I noticed when reading the report was that the flamingo uh, was not on the report. So you can see uh, the flamingo in its original location uh, and it was replaced soon after by a uh, tundra swan by the same artist. Those are two versions of tundra swan. Uh, you'll notice right away after looking at the red-tailed hawk by Mr. Audubon that these have a very different, much more contemporary, looser vibe. Um, Audubon as a painter was uh, somewhat original in his approach. He had his own methods. And I felt as someone that, you know, wants to cultivate young artists and in the spirit of Audubon that artists should be within reason so long as it's reasonably PG uh, be allowed to paint in whatever style they wanted. So we essentially, you know, we'll tell an artist, you know, this is the list of birds from which you should paint. Uh, they select a bird uh, and then and then they paint in whatever style they want. So these are two tundra swans in the same location where the original flamingo is. This is the current version of the tundra swan. Uh, for the most part, when a painting is made, um, it's what remains in this particular case because we have a close relation with the artist and with this particular store. Uh, we've had multiple versions of the same bird. Um, I showed you the swallowtail kite before. Um, we started with roll down gates in New York City. Um, we sort of graduated to uh, larger murals. Uh, what's really exciting about this swallowtail kite, which as you can see, is based on the original composition by Audubon. Um, what's really neat about it is that this mural is physically on land, which once was part of the Audubon estate. Uh, Audubon lived this very extraordinary life. I won't get into it for too long. Very interesting life. But towards the end of his life, he bought acreage in Upper Manhattan in New York City. And he essentially retired there, though he was still doing projects 
Uh, he lived there until he died. And I'm kind of pointing, uh, it's kind of irrelevant, but behind the church, which you can see on the right, um, is the Audubon Crypt, of which you saw a picture before. Uh, the Swaltel kite that you see is by an artist, Lakwanana Yu, and um, Lenny, as we call him, uh, Lenny wanted to emphasize cooperation amongst different species. And so he chose to paint uh, 12 different species in the body of the swallowtail kite. Uh, one species that he added, which is um, not in the climber report, is the passenger pigeon, which is now extinct, but which numbered, I think they say in the billions in Audubon's lifetime, it was essentially hunted to extinction. Uh, something that uh, Audubon wrote about because it was becoming endangered in his own lifetime, something that Audubon wrote about uh, in his diaries. Um, sorry. Um, this is the American Red Start by Bluster One. I'm just going to sort of scroll through some of our images so you have a sense. Um, I'm actually going to see Bluster later today about painting another mural. And another artist that I'll be seeing later today about painting another mural is Martha Alicia Matarita. Uh, and in Spanish below and in English above, it says, uh, the vulture is a bird that is often misunderstood. So getting back to what I was saying before, you know, we want artists to paint however they want. It could be a more traditional depiction, um, or it can be something that incorporates uh, different uh, iconography, text, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Bald Eagle by the artist Peter Daverington, um, The Great Gray Owl by an artist Key Detail. Uh, all of these artists that you've seen so far are essentially New York based. Um, the artist 50, Paul Johnson, was visiting from Detroit. Um, and he actually is friends with the artist Louise Chen, uh, who also goes by Wheezy, who painted this uh, gross speak. That's actually half of the mural, the other half continues around the bend. Can everyone still hear me? Because I feel like I'm talking to myself. <laughs> you sound great. <laughs> okay, amazing. I'm going to carry on for a few more minutes, show you a little bit more about the project. Um, one of the things that's cool is that the project started with roll down gates. Um, it graduated to more traditional large scale murals. But one of the things that we thought um, would be interesting would be uh, installations. Um, we're always looking to uh, beautify. So this wasn't some pretty empty alcove in the side of a historic building. It was rotting chipboard uh, with um, old sort of um, old lead bars. Um, and we got permission from the landlord to remove the bars. And this is by uh, an artist, Tom Sanford. It's a picture of Audubon. Uh, it's, a, it's a painting of Audubon based on a, on a photograph taken late in his life. Um, different artists or every artist has a different reason for choosing uh, a bird. In this case, Tom likes to paint with the color cerulean blue, so he selected the cerulean warbler. Um, these um, warblers are situated over a subway station entrance, which you can't really see. Um, and again, getting to, to the idea of beautifying, there were two 11 foot by five foot ads, about 25 years old, sort of uh, in complete disrepair. And uh, a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears went into convincing the city to allow us to uh, remove the ads and replace them with these two paintings by the artist George Berugi, who uh, this probably isn't the right word, um, and I'm with such a well-educated group, so I'm embarrassed to use the wrong word, but, you know, he wanted to humanize, uh, feel free to correct me on what should be the right word, uh, he wanted to humanize uh, these birds, so he, and he tends to do that regularly in his art, um, you know, he, he puts them in this position uh, that people are not accustomed to seeing animals in, which is something that he does a lot in his art. Um, again, just like the last one and this installation, sort of looking for more or less traditional places in which to install. So this is a gas station also on Audubon's former estate uh, where we uh, asked the gas station very nicely if in the, the bay windows of their garage if we could install paintings. So this is an example of one of the paintings, A Long-Eared Owl by the artist Greg Burak. Um, ATM is an artist who uh, has been painting uh, threatened bird spe threatened species, but specific, mostly threatened bird species because he's a very passionate birder um, in his uh, native UK. Um, he was visiting the United States for the first time and he painted three murals for us. This was one of them and I really love how the bird looks like it's perched 
um, over uh, or on the gate. Um, one of the things that, that, one of the moments that I really loved uh, was when someone came to me and basically said that their, their kid was less stressed to go to this pediatrician um, because of this welcoming bird mural. Um, and you'll notice uh, that it's uh, a grouping of different species that are uh, tending to their young. Um, so, you know, while we give the artists freedom, um, it is nice, you know, when they come back with something that feels thematically connected with the location, in this case, the, um, uh, the, the store. Um, another large scale mural by the artist Mary Lacey, who's relatively close to you. Um, she's, uh, I think, in New Hampshire. Um, she's possibly painted in Maine in the, in the past. This is a, a pinion jay. Um, most of our artists, I, I, I should say a little bit, I know I'll be asked um, during the question session about how we select the artists. So I'll say that, you know, in the beginning, it was people that I knew, friends of theirs, um, you know, slowly it, it evolved into um, a situation where we um, were really looking for artists who were passionate about birds. You know, now we're at the point where, you know, our ideal artists and many of the artists that we work with are artists who are not just passionate about birds, but their work focuses on environmental justice. Um, we give preference to artists who are from uh, Upper Manhattan, from New York City. Uh, Mary is an example of an artist who had painted birds and was sort of uh, her interests intersect with ours. Uh, she came to us from from New England, um, but you know, her work is so absolutely wonderful. I was thrilled that she came down. Um, a New York-based artist, uh, possibly Jersey-based, I'm not sure. Uh, Gerald Lozano. Um, this photo was actually taken on uh, one of the lifts. Um, a couple of the photos you've see, seen were taken by my friend Mike Fernandez, who works for Audubon, who takes some great photos and video for us. Uh, this is the hooded warbler. When you get up to um, John James Audubon's hooded warbler on the flip, whether that's uh, two years from now or six years from now or whenever it is, uh, you'll notice, and you can look it up afterwards, that uh, Jera felt like um, she wanted to she wanted to connect the work that she made compositionally with uh, the original Audubon composition. You can see um, the similarities uh, if you have a look. Uh, the nice thing about this one is that it's situated over a school playground. And um, beforehand, it was a pretty decrepit brick wall with peeling paint. Um, so I was pretty excited about, about that mural. This is pretty old, but gives you a sense of the location um, of a lot of the murals based in New York. Um, a little bit about the process. I don't know how much time I have, but just you're good. Yeah, in case you're curious. Um, you know, we identify a, a space, we speak with the person who's um, able to legally give us permission. So uh, on the left, um, you can see uh, a, a metal gate, which from which we would need permission from the landlord. Uh, on the right, from the homeowners of these townhouses. And you can see my little, uh, my little notes uh, once I see a location about where we can actually paint. Uh, this is a space um that we got permission for and which for the last oh my god maybe two years we've been working on um the artist carlos pinto who's a brooklyn-based artist and works with um i don't know how he secures volunteers but he works with a group of, of young people and older people i don't actually know uh, how it works i haven't had a chance unfortunately to visit his studio but he works with people and he creates mosaics out of uh, reclaimed wood. Uh, <laughs> reclaimed wood, excuse me. I'm getting confused between multiple projects. Um, <laughs> he makes mosaics out of uh, reclaimed ceramics. Um, I'm not exactly sure he collects them, but this is a, an in-process shot of the trumpeter swans that he's been building, which will be installed once all the insurance is in order on um, this location at 163rd and Broadway in Manhattan. Um, when we, when we identify a location, when it's small scale like a gate, we do not present the store owners in advance with compositions. It's just a decision that we made 
a while ago. It's too complicated. You know, we ensure them that it won't be um, grotesque. You did see a grotesque mural, somewhat grotesque mural earlier on, one of the Tundra Swan, um, one of the Tundra Swan iterations that you saw. Um, that was a, a, an instance where the store owner asked for something aggressive. Um, but you can see in this image with a large scale mural, this is a 60 foot tall mural. On the left, you have the mock-up that was created by the artist, um, Cruz, Nina Cruz, who's a sort of well-known Ital uh, Italian born artist who's been living in New York City for many, many years. Um, on the right, you can see the executed mural. Um, in this case, it's a, uh, it's a scene of three tundra swans in this sort of uh, dystopian future in which the polar ice caps have melted. Uh, you can see the, the raised water level and they're fighting for uh, the last bit of food, this uh, snake. Um, the murals sometimes disappear. This is a, a wonderful mural of a roseate spoonbill by a New York artist, Danielle Mastrion. Um, and the store had been closed when we uh, installed this or when she painted it. Um, a new store opened, they removed the gates. And so we had her paint the roseate spoonbill elsewhere on 144th Street. Um, total tangent, but I think it's funny, so I'll mention it. Um, we used to buy linoleum at this store when I was a kid. I only realized that I found that out, um, you know, after I started talking to the store owner and to, and to my parents after this mural's painting, which I thought was pretty cool. So this sort of gives you a sense of what we've been doing in Upper Manhattan over the last five years. And there are many, many more murals. I would encourage any, all of you, uh, when you're next in New York, to go to our website and print up a map and take a self-guided tour or an official tour. There are tours organized by New York City Audubon, which is a local branch of the Audubon Society. Uh, but the murals continue elsewhere. So um, we, we started originally, it was kind of an arbitrary decision, but we, we were only painting in Upper Manhattan. And I like the idea of people being able to walk from one mural to the next. I really felt like there was something organic and beautiful about that. Um, but we have enough in Upper Manhattan that we sort of felt like if the right opportunity presented itself that we would do murals in other parts of the city. So this is a 200 foot wide mural uh, by Peter Daverington uh, of two American black ducks, uh, which are ducks that you would find on the East River. Um, this is in Astoria, Queens. And the only way you can really see this mural is if you're on a boat from the East River, or if you know where to see it from the east side of New York City. Um, and the exciting thing is the Audubon Mural Project has satellites um, in other parts of not just the country, but even the world. Um, uh, there are no images in this PowerPoint presentation, but uh, there are murals that went up this summer in France, uh, which were related to a huge uh, climate conference that was supposed to take place in Marseille, but unfortunately, was canceled just like everything else. Um, so this is in Chicago in, in Rogers Park. Um, you have a series of murals um, in an area called uh, Mile of Murals. Um, in Rockford, Illinois, and I showed this to Marieka before we started. Um, I'm wearing my t-shirt of the Peregrine Falcon, um, which was declared uh, the official city bird um, by uh, the mayor of Rockford, Illinois recently, which was an initiative um, started by the organizer of this satellite project's 14-year-old daughter, which I think is pretty cool. And I bought this t-shirt from her. It's also a great t-shirt. Give her a little plug. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the interesting thing is a lot of people, to my shock, have been <laughs> really inspired by this project, not just um, the more predictable reaction uh, school teachers uh, who have, you know, decided to use the project as a platform to teach about any subject that interests them that's, that's sort of connected to the project. It can be environmental science, it could be birds, it could be uh, art, uh, it could be history. Um, but, you know, one of the nice things is seeing extensions of the project, the project sort of take on a life of its own. So in uh, Bozeman, Montana, uh, next to Yellowstone, there's a um, sort of biology institute called the Craighead Institute. And they reached out to me a few years ago and said, we love your project and we want to do something like that in Bozeman. And, and as with other cities and places, um, you know, I've sort of 
in an advisory capacity, help them begin the process. But what was really nice is they decided um, that they wanted to depict a number of locally threatened species, not just birds. So you can see, you know, on the right, uh, this uh, sturgeon. I don't know what kind of sturgeon it is. Um, so, you know, it's really nice to sort of see the project take on a life of its own. Uh, you always got to give credit where credit's due. So I'll let this, I'll let this sit on the screen for a moment. Um, that's sort of in 10, 15 minutes, I don't know how long I was talking, I wasn't timing myself, but uh, that sort of gives you a very basic sense of, of the mural project. Um, let me take this off. Avi, thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, I want to make sure, and thank you so much. Um, I want to make sure that if anyone has any questions, um, you have a few moments for questions? Absolutely. Awesome. So I think the way we can do that is, um, I don't, well, we'll, we'll play with chaos here. If you want to just unmute yourself and turn your video on or just unmute yourself, um, ask away. Don't all shout at once. <laughs> I was, this is, my name is Mary. That was fantastic. I, I almost think that I might like the virtual event better than the live event because I can see the book so well. And then for you to be able to give this presentation online, it, the, it's just amazing. My breath is taken away. And I wonder if you could, when you share the video, can you share the map some, um, of where all the murals are? And, yeah, absolutely. and I see that somebody just asked about a website. I would also love to see the website. That was fantastic. You did great for being a non, you know, a non-techno guy, as you say. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I, um, I'll answer a few of the questions that are coming in um, to chat. Um, first one, very important. Let me see if I can get this right. I was asked, I was asked if I could give the call of the red-tailed hawk. Oh, wait, let me, let me try if I could do that again. Little help from YouTube. Um, the beer so let me, let me answer the other questions. Um, how do we get funds for the project? Um, so, oh boy, I don't know how many people on this call are involved in, you know, NGO and or arts fundraising. <laughs> um, but the answer is not easily. Uh, the better answer is, is we've received grants. Um, we sell prints. Uh, there's a, there's a mural. I got a, there's a mural that we didn't show by George Berugi. Uh, maybe I'll pull it up on my screen, uh, towards the end because uh, it's so fantastic. And we sell prints of that as a fundraiser. Um, we've thrown fundraising parties. Um, the National Audubon Society throws in some money, not much, sorry guys, but a little bit. Uh, so it's, it's a challenge, but um, raising money for any arts project is always challenging. Um, I, don't come, I don't come to this project from the education scene uh, or the environmental justice scene. You know, I really come to it from the, the art part. Um, let me look for some more questions. So I... I was asked if there's a website, um, and I wrote it down um, in the chat. It's audubon.org slash AMP for Audubon Mural Project. And there's loads of information about the project um, online. And you know, one of the things that I hope is clear, but I didn't mention, um, I'm really interested in developing the project in more places all over the country. So you know, feel free to email me. I'll leave my email at the end. If you have ideas, oh, I'm from you know, I'm from Austin and I've got a great wall in mind and I know somebody who wants to underwrite it and I already picked out a, a bird that is relevant to, to that particular flyway. Um, and it's such a great idea and I've developed the whole thing and, and Avi, I just need a little bit of help. That that sounds ideal. Um, but, you know- so my funding in tech. <laughs> exactly, but you know, we've been trying to get something going in Maine and hopefully that will still happen, uh, but we're open to, to, to anything. Um, let's I'm already see. brainstorming some ideas here in Brunswick, which is awesome in the chat. What was that? Yes, yes, yes. We would, we would love to collaborate with 
Maria Cano is with Bowdoin or, you know, with a local artist or someone who's involved in the art scene at Bowdoin to uh, execute a mural there, that would be, be really exciting. Um, any other questions? Oh, awesome. We have, there's an amazing gallery in Portland called Space Gallery. Um, and Carolyn, who is their uh, exhibits coordinator there, has just popped her email, but I can also share that with you. Um, and I know in Portland, which is just, I don't know, 40 minutes south of Brunswick, there's a cool uh, mural um, initiative that's happening there too. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, we're going to make something happen in Maine, and I'm, I'm so excited. Um, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. We always build this as a short and sweet event. Avi, I can't express how grateful I am for you joining us today and doing such, um, sharing such a cool project and being like so fabulous um, for joining us on Zoom. And, and really technologically, I am very impressed. <laughs> Um, what I, I'm going to pop into the chat right now before you um, all leave the Zoom room are the, chat, the links that I mentioned um, before. So we've got a link here to the um, Bowdoin College Library's commitment to anti-racism. Um, also the link for a special collections event page. So I want to see all of you back here on October 2nd for our second virtual page turning event. And then finally, um, one of the things that I had worked on um, while working from home was building out an exhibition about Bowdoin's copy of the of our Audubon Birds of America. There's also links to the patch page turnings there. So um, please uh, feel free to visit that if you need a little Audubon boost um, in, in the next month. So um, Avi's popped his email into the, um, into the chat, uh, I think. That's it, that's it. Thank yeah. you all so much. Um, and again, I'll be posting a recording of this event so you can catch it um, soon. Thank you, Avi. Thank you.